Welcome to New Realities. I'm Alan Steinfeld, and this program is about the evolution of consciousness and where we're moving as individuals and as a civilization. So there's no one, I feel, who's better informed to address that uh, duality of being than today's guest, James O.D., former president of IONS. He's just written an amazing book called The Conscious Activist, where activism meets mysticism. Marion Williamson said about the conscious activist, after reading the conscious activist, you'll drop to your knees in open hearted awe, and then you'll rise to your feet, inspired to act in a truly transformational way. I agree. Thanks, James, for being here today. Great to be with you, Alan. Really wonderful. Your book is interesting because you really present the two sides of what it is to be in the world in, in a conscious way. For a long time in the East, it was just the personal development, and the West was like, let's change the political system. So you've had this way of sort of combining these two different aspects of, of conscious evolution. Talk about that a little bit. Well, I think it's all a learning curve, it's a developmental curve, you know, we, we, sometimes today we talk about instant activists, oh I signed this petition online, I'm an activist, right. you know, and I went to this course on meditation, you know, I'm a spiritual mystic, and it's not quite that easy. There are tremendous lessons to be learned if you want your activism to, to be non-polarizing. That takes quite a ride. Mm -hmm. And if you want your experience to be truly a deep experience of mystical reality, they both take a journey. But I hope that my life is a lesson in that when you learn the development of the lessons in both of those arenas, you can start to enter into an arena where your activism has a healing dimension to it and a non-polarizing dimension to it. And your mysticism is not just transcendental, off-planet, somewhere else where you're having a beautiful, blissful experience while the world goes to hell in a basket. Yeah, that's been a problem with a lot of the uh, spiritualist movements. They ignore the social conditions. But then again, the people concerned with a lot of the social conditions are making up for the lack of something they've given themselves, you know. So they, they're finding their anger or their release in the world. And I think what you're saying is uh, one is an aspect of the other in a way. It's like the there's the uh, inner work with the self and then seeing ourselves as part of something bigger. I, I think that's what you're doing here, right? Would you say that? Yeah, I think absolutely that we, we find that we can merge with the social connections and the social conditions in a way that, as I said before, is a healing dimension. You know, I think when you mentioned activist anger and so on. It's really not about making anything wrong. It's not about making that anger wrong. It's, you know, what Gandhi said is like anger is a raw force in the universe and it needs to be directed, channeled like electricity into light. And so you start off your career as an activist, maybe righteously fueling powerful moral outrage. And I say to folks these days, I'm sort of out of my moral outrage. But I'm not out of activist commitment. Well, you're out of moral outrage, but your life has also been about that. It's not, not necessarily outrage, but taking... Uh, talk about... I mean, in the book you give lots of examples of you know, your activism in the world. Talk about a little bit of what you been through some of the events you've dealt with, but also the, the um, psychological and spir spiritual residue of those events. Can you, can you tell me about right. that? Yeah. Uh, <clears throat> you know, as a young activist in London, mm -hmm. I started researching the conditions of senior citizens and poor people 
in South London and then organizing other young people to do the same. So we did a massive survey, started to get attention, and I exposed some real horror stories. And minister responsible, you know, wrote a letter to me as a 16-year-old and said, it seems as if you have some serious criticisms of the way we do our social welfare for senior citizens. I would appreciate it if you would come in and meet me to discuss these concerns. And I was, this is, you know, an early activist. I wrote back and said, you know what you have to do, and when you do it, we can meet. Sort of refusing dialogue is adolescent. That was an adolescent response. It was a fear that I couldn't hold my own. So, of course, the spiritual reality is dialogic, it's connective, it's relational. It says we are a part of each other, we're all connected, we're all inseparably connected. And so dialogue must be a fundamental strategy of activism. Mm -hmm. Well, it, it, yeah, it, I think you're right. It is a, a fundamental... Um, I, I, I mean, on one level, there's that dialogue with our, our peers, and then on the other level, there's the dialogue with the, with the self or the, the source. That, that's the other level of, of dialogue you address here, and you know, you're, you're awakening to that. And I think you can't be a mystic. It's easy to be an activist, but you can't be a mystic unless you've developed that dialogue with, with this greater thing. Right. But it's a different kind of dialogue, isn't it? It's a taster, I call it you know, a taster's dialogue. It's not an intellectual pursuit. Mm. You know, that's what you've got to go beyond the polarity, the nice, convenient, rational platform of the mind. You've got to step off that in your dialogue mm -hmm. and say, mm -hmm. I'm here to taste the reality of universal love. I'm here to taste the experience of self-realization. And yes, hold the mirror up to me so that I may see my own ego, see its artful and sneaky ways. And that's a different kind of dialogue, isn't it? It's a very well, well, experiential mode of encounter. Not that in social healing work, which you know I've also done, yes. to bring victims and perpetrators together, mm. you're also mm. in a kind of very deep experiential dialogue where you have to suspend the judgmental mind and listen to the heart of suffering, listen to the total reality of another person's experience and be with that experience no matter what your ideological, theological constructs are. But isn't that sort of the purpose of the outer world, you know, the, the vow of the bodhisattva? Uh, I mean, in a sense, there might not be any real separation if you're in this world, if you're, I mean, if you're dialoguing with this presence or this connection and and the outer world then is the reflection of that as well. So, you know, a lot of the, the mystics may not see that sort of uh, separation that uh, maybe in the West we see a little more of. Do you, do you know what I mean? It's the same thing. Because right. I am that, as, as Nisa Gadatha said. You are the, the, the suffering and the oppression you see in the world. So. You know, in a way, you're bringing the bow of the Bodhisattva to the West with this kind of uh, book you've written, I, I would say. Yes, you know, Meister Eckhart's statement, the eye with which you see God is the same eye with which God sees you. And that is the ultimate goal. That is when you've really passed through 
the dualities. The dualities have a certain kind of structural reality that mm. are part of the activist toolkit. In other words, when the New Ager comes along and says, oh, don't preoccupy with negativity, you know, just, just explore the positive realms, I say no, 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 no to torture, no to torture. You will never pull me from that stance because no to torture is a deep affirmation of life and values and commitments and realities. It isn't as, it isn't a false, false positivity. And so I think the Bodhisattva has to transcend that false positivity and say, it's hard, it's cruel, it's wrong. And, you know, we do have a moral compass. We don't, in non-dualism, we don't forsake morality. That there is a right and wrong that we step off of. But we step off of it into a non-judgmental plane. It says the perpetrator is wounded. Can you see the wound in the perpetrator? Look at the difficulty that lies in examining the wound of the perpetrator. Yeah, but that, yes. No, no, I'm, I, I think you're right. I think that's where we need to come to as a planet, the, the wound of the perpetrator. But talk about a little, uh, a few of the stories from your life. I think you mentioned a place in the book where you said you were stabbed, you know, and some of the lessons you, you learned from from being out there almost innocently, almost righteously, in a good way, and, 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 and what you had to go through in your own life to overcome some of the shock and horror that exists in the world. Yes, I, I was out late in Izmir, Turkey. I was a teacher at the Izmir Collegiate Institute, and there were left and right students fighting each other in this marketplace and I ducked into a side street and into a doorway and waited a long time. I thought it was a long time. When I came out there were five left and they thought I was a straggler from the other group and they immediately came at me with a knife and I was a bit like a Celtic dancing whirling dervishes. as I tried to protect my life but they caught me up against a wall and the knife was, you know, the lower part of the rib cage, you know, right pointing at the heart. And I squeaked out, I'm English. Oh. And that, that was enough to, this kind of big brawny kid pushed the guy with the knife away. And my life was saved. And then as I struggled to move on, I fainted with the loss of blood. And the mysterious angel of the night came and dragged me into his car and dropped me at the steps of the public hospital and then drove away. Mm. And I, you would think that my first reaction was going to be, I got to get out of here but a strange, mysterious sense of commitment arose. That, you know, that was, Alan, a deep initiation that said, what is life? What is the purpose of your life? Go deeper. You almost lost it. What would it have meant if you lost your life at this point? There's so much more to deepen. And after that, I was taken to Beirut and to the massacre of the Palestinians the Sabra Shatila camp, to, to witness human killing and slaughter on this scale, and really to go into my own personal despair at humanity. It was in the midst of the rubble of a Palestinian camp, with an old Palestinian man who called me over for coffee with some English doctors. And first we refused him and and we could see he wanted to do this. What happened there mysteriously was that sense of the spirit rising out of him, the indomitable spirit speaking to my soul, saying, remember, 
you know, the spirit is is the predominant feature. And so it was in witnessing his dignity and his spiritual nature that I climbed out of that hell hole, dedicated my life. I went and worked for Amnesty International. And so I think the reality of those experiences really demonstrates for me always that you can get lost in the tyranny, in the horror, just like ISIS these days, it can really pull you down. But it's not the end of the story. If you look beyond that, if you can experience beyond that, you see the organizing power of spiritual reality. Mm -hmm. don't, don't, I mean, it's an old question, but don't you, um, and I think you probably had that awareness if there's a loving God if there's this um, mm, purpose for being how, how can such atrocities and injustices exist be allowed to exist why do they exist because we're really here all of us is to really have a, a beautiful joyful uh, experience of incarnation how can these I mean What's the answer to, I mean, h how can that go on, you know? That question mm -hmm. has a kind of hidden duality. Mm -hmm. There's a God and there's us. But really, it's all God. And what a God, what a divine awakener that says, I'm going to throw myself into the gaseous form and I'm going to climb through the gaseous form into the material form, into the rocks, into the mountains. And I'm going to crawl out of the mountains as insects, as bacteria. I'm going to keep moving through the evolutionary process, beginning to widen the aperture of my consciousness. I'm going to survive the terrors of hostile winters and tremendous conditions. And then I'm going to reach this stage of self-consciousness where I have to then unwind all of the evolutionary thinking. It, was, it helped me survive so that I can return to absolute non-dual, non-judgmental consciousness. So it's really God learning about the waking up process. Well, I mean, if you take that position, then you might say, well, everything is perfect. We don't need to, to do anything about it. It's just God learning about him itself. But maybe there's that other function as the human being uh, being tested for um, integrity, maybe, or, or, or soulful purpose where we're placed in such a... Um, a, a, a dualistic world where we have to then uh, be responsible for taking action and 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 maybe God doesn't have anything to do about it on that level uh, you know it, it's you know it's these perennial questions that everyone asks yes the eye of God the uh, the the eye I see through is the eye God sees through but you know, there's that question, why do anything about it? And are we here to, to build our spiritual strength by doing something about the injustices? You know, that's sort of, the, I mean, I'm just saying, when I'm in India, as you know, there's so much pollution and, and overcrowding, and it's all God, and it's all beautiful, and that really turns me off personally, because, you know, God takes care of everything, but yet there's a huge problem there. And then there's this, you know, I'm just restating the problem in, in, uh, the, or the situation and other ways of questioning. I'm saying it's all perfect on that level that you've just described. Yeah, God's learning about itself. And, and where does the human integrity fit in? And, and how is that a spiritual um, um, mission, in a sense? I think that's a great question. <laughs> big, big, big question. But I, I, I think we have to go to the heart of the evolutionary process as one 
it creates impressions, you know, what we call sanskaras, mm -hmm. that, that we're each responsible for unwinding the impressions, because otherwise we're trapped. We ourselves are trapped in the conditioning process. So we have to decondition, we have to unwind those sanskaras. And we are, no one else in the universe can do it for us. Universal structure seems to be, we're entirely accountable. So, you know, Meher Baba says it beautifully, the saints and the so-called sinners all have to face, you know, what they have they have lived. Mm -hmm. And so th those impressions are then you know, carried from lifetime to lifetime. We are responsible for our part in the story. And that's mm -hmm. why it's not a sort of collective get out kind of story that suggests that well, if there's a big movement, it'll just carry me along and I'll be fine. The universe says, you know, you are accountable for your acts of lust or violence. Or you personally must unwind those impressions by the way you live, by how you learn. So there's no way, there's no possible way in, in the cosmology that I live through that you can escape personal responsibility. Right, but there's the other side of the true mystic or what's been traditionally the people who've gone into caves and they've um, meditated for a long, long time. And some people say because of that inner work, they are actually uplifting the planet in, in a much deeper, uh, more responsible way because of the the internal journey, I mean, that may be a cop-out, but what, or it may be true. I, I, I'm not at that level where I can know, but what do you think about that? The people who've gone, people like Jesus, Buddha, I mean, uh, um, they've gone inward into such a place where they vibrate a new vibration for the planet. And, and oh, absolutely. Yeah, but, but some... I don't agree that mm -hmm. it is an omnicentric universe. God is in the center and there is no periphery. That applies to human rights and to cosmology. There is no lesser person on the face of this earth. There is nothing lesser. It's all connected. So in the map of consciousness, you know, it's, it's so profoundly connected so that an injury to another is really an injury to self. And, you know, I was looking at that movie Sirius, which is about extraterrestrial life and very interesting movie. And I was president of the Institute of Noetic Sciences where we were connected to random number generators around the world. And the movie talks about them. And then there's a question to the Dalai Lama himself. Well, it seems that under very highly stressful conditions, these random number generators move from randomness into coherence. And so, Your Holiness, are these random number generators, these little machines, are they in co conscious in some way? Great question. Yeah. Are they conscious in some way? And he, he paused for a while and he thought and he said, if you think they are conscious, they are conscious. Wow. What an interesting answer. In other words, consciousness itself is so powerful that your thought form of relational consciousness to these machines gives them consciousness, gives them a role in consciousness. That's how influential. So if I radiate healing, and that's why you know, I wrote a book called Cultivating Peace, and there's a whole chapter on listening. Listening is so profound because it's a stance in consciousness that receives the other and it receives it with that heart of attention which we call compassion. And by so doing, 
you can literally change the biochemistry of another person's body. You can change, you know, that all that fight flight mechanisms by deep, profound listening. So consciousness and stances of generosity and listening and compassion in consciousness are definitely part of the waveform of change that, that is possible for the planet. Well, maybe that's the way some people need to be a social activist by going inward and radiating that peace without taking, without, you know, without going to the Middle East and dealing with the Palestinians and Israelis. They, I think if there's enough people to do that, it might make a change. But you felt in your life, and even with your mystical experiences, that you needed to be there. You needed to be um, affecting change on, on that physical level. Uh, have you... Have you reconsidered that at all? I mean, uh, you know, the fact that, you, you know, you could also affect change by just emanating it without having to go to the Middle East or, uh, or, or in that yes, condition. Uh, yeah. When you think of the work of Marshall Rosenberg yes. and you know, the, the central question, he says, is the nonviolent question, the, the peace question. What do you need me to understand? I don't have to travel the world to ask myself and others, what do you really need me to understand? Mm -hmm. It's a powerful dialogic reality. So I, I definitely think that consciousness, meditation, compassion can be embodied and enacted in stances like listening and dialogue anywhere, all the way to your home. I mean, where does it all begin? How much dialogic you know, listening <laughs> goes on in family mm -hmm. situations? Right. Um, Actually, Marshall Rosenberg, I interviewed him, he said the most violence that he's ever seen. I mean, after even being with Israelis and Palestinians and the Utus and the Tutus, he says the worst violence he ever seen has been between husbands and wives and parents and children. And uh, that was quite shocking and, and probably true. And um, no, I, I think it's good to just address the question and come to the conclusion, you know, that it, it's, it, we have to take action. There's that uh, Kabbalistic saying, if a uh, if I'm not for myself, who will be for me? And if I'm only for myself, who will be for me? So it, I, I think that's the line you're sort of walking, the, the, the line between self and others or self as a projection of the others. And, and how can more people be aware of that? What would you suggest in, you know, in bringing people into that balance, let's say? Yes, I'm reminded of the Dalai Lama's words when he says, it is not enough to be compassionate, one must act. And then... Wait, say that again, I missed the last, it kind of faded out. One, it's not enough to be compassionate, what's the rest of that? One must act. Oh, right. Okay, yes. yes. And so, I know that, uh, if you like, on my deathbed, I'll remember moments of action I remember trusting deeply that my instinct about the Yemeni ambassador back in those years when I was in Amnesty, that he was a good guy, was true. And when five people were about to be executed in his country, I called him and I said, you and I can change this story. I'm sorry I moved. But I, I said, you and I can change this story. Here's how we do it. You write a telegram to your government. Amnesty International is going to call for congressional hearings on Yemen. We, we can create a media storm around it. Those, people, those five people were never executed. Mm -hmm. you know, or another story, the power of inspirational action when we received 
a letter from a prison guard from a dungeon in the Atlas Mountains where most of the prisoners were dying off of starvation and cold. And I testified in Congress in a hearing on Morocco and read this letter from the guy describing the conditions. And six months after that testimony, the king of Morocco closed down that dungeon. And a year later, one of the prisoners who had been there 17 years came to my office in Washington to thank me. And that's the sense when, the, when you really see that conscience, that old-fashioned word, convened and acted upon, can in fact you know, create radically different conditions. And so I, I'm absolutely with you in saying there is this balance of being drawn into the field of action and being drawn into the inner realms of love and then having them communicate with each other. But, but it is a beautiful thing knowing that you've saved those people's lives and you've contributed to this kind of change. I, I mean, I know it's not an ego thing, but it's a sense of maybe uh, doing the work uh, of, the, of the love of God. Would you say that? I mean, would you say you feel that? I'd say I would feel that, but in my own development, what happened was I moved more and more to what are the root causes here? How do we address these root causes? Where does the wound get transmitted from generation to generation, almost was revered and upheld? How do we get that wound? That young man in Charleston who went in and murdered people, you know, was carrying the wound of race, racism, transmitted silently, secretly, and openly in family networks, in cultural contexts. That's what then you start to say. It's not enough to try to rectify the situation on the surface. You must go deeper into the causal weave of wounding itself and wound attachment. So wound transmission and wound attachment. What a horrible vengeance it is on the victim that they become in some cases, are so attached to their wounds that they create more havoc and chaos. But it's still happening and, and probably a much bigger way. I mean, how do we get there and, and, pe and people's attachment to the story of who they think they are and their, and their fabricated history that has... Um, you know, um, in a way, poison their mind, so they have to live out some um, violent fantasies. Uh, I mean, it's just so insane. But how do we get to the root of woundedness? You know, for humanity. I mean, uh, it's the question of our times. I think it is a question, mm -hmm. and <clears throat> and deciphering then the nature of collective wounds. Mm -hmm. and, you, know, you know, there is what I call the labyrinth of seduction. And we're, you know, you might call it Maya too, but it's that seduction in the, that is crept into the systemic reality of the world that you know, all we need is another upgrade. All we need is to get more stuff whatever the cost to the planet. And we're, we're participants in the seduction. We're human rights activists who pay taxes to governments that feed the world as weapons and then go out and fight those who they've delivered weapons to. We're the ecologists who fly around in our planes. We're inside the system. And partly that's the good news. You know, I love to tell the story of the Aboriginal people in, in Africa, of, 
of the, the story of end times where they call, they say, this is the time of all devourer. What a graphic and clear. All devourer. And all devourer is eating up everything. And Mantis, the spokesperson of the animal kingdom, says, you know, we must gather all the animals, animals together and have a great dialogue about this. And, and uh, porcupine says, says no. I'm getting some, I'm getting some feedback. Okay. Uh, it might be on my end. Okay, go ahead. Por yeah, go ahead. I'm with you. The porcupine, the activist in this story. I keep hearing myself. Okay, try it now. Go ahead. So porcupine says, No, I won't join you because if all devour comes, all devour will eat us all. And that's what happens. Mantis, the divine spokesperson, all the animals get eaten up by all devour, except porcupine who's buried her two children. One is the child of the right hand, the child of will. The other is the child of the left hand, the child of compassion. And she says, you two must go together, will and compassion, and open the belly of all devour while it's sleeping. There's only a sacred moment when he's sated and then he starts eating again. Go now. So a sense of timing for the activist. I love it, it feels so true. And that sense of the conjunction of right and left, will and compassion. And they open, they, they tear apart the belly of all devour. And there standing in the belly is Mantis and all the animals in a golden light. And Mantis says, and now our story is renewed, for it is inside the belly of all devour and outside of the belly of all devour, that our story will be complete. And that for me is a deep code, mystical and activist, that says, is inside the military, it is inside business, it is inside the very heart of the devouring structure, that the transformation will begin, and it will be outside. Those who say, no, we won't cooperate with you, it will create a different system. It's the coming together of the inner and the outer in a very graphic way. Don't you love that story? It is. It's a great story, but it also, I get a little depressed by it in the sense that is it a perpetual fight? Is the devourer the constant uh, struggle that we've signed up for here on Earth? And is there's always the activist or the mystic um, overcoming the, the material consuming desire. Is that our perpetual journey as human beings? I mean, I, I don't know. I hope not. I hope we reach a, a level of, of peace and contentment to, to, to start to activate the real values of what it is to be human, which is not really always struggling and fighting, fighting evil, evil fighting, us, but to, to be the creative um, poets and painters and artists and dancers, I think that's our real human destiny and we've been caught up with this preoccupation with devouring, which is of course all of us, like you said, yes, we have to take the planes, we have to work inside the system, but my vision and hope is that we reach another level of humanity where we transcend that old story and we start to write new stories and new stories will be about who we really are um, once we reach this level playing field, you know, once we um, overcome. But I don't know, I mean, this has been such a constant uh, 5,000, maybe 10,000 year struggle. Is there an end to it? That's my question. Uh, well, I think it's a great question. It was beautifully put and powerfully put. And all I can say is, that's the question I've been living my life. That is the question that we must live through. Can we indeed 
through the transformation of our consciousness and the enactment of ways of being, create a culture of peace on planet Earth? And I think the answer is yes, it is possible. We will always have challenges because the challenge will be to realize that the universe, you know, when I mentioned the labyrinth of seduction, the universe itself is saying, I wish to equalize with you. I, all-knowing and all power in the universe, wish to enter your heart as, as equals. And that takes profound realization for us to take that journey. So I think there will always be, as we develop and return to essence, spiritual challenges. But surely, as you are intimating, we can have those challenges in creative, artful, existential ways that don't create the level of obscene cruelty and pornography and pornographic violence that we have, have found our way into. And I think, I, I would just say that it gets to me so much that it's moving below the radar screen of the public media because the public media is generally not media like yours the public media in general is part of the seduction it's part of let's even consume news as consumption yum 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 this feed 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 the system that's the seduction and when we d disconnect from that we find that there are more people who are disconnecting from that seduction and really embracing a convivial and creative humanity arising. It's not just the, uh, the pornographic violence, it's sanctioned violence by governments. You know, the CIA or the FBI was said, yes, we're torturing people and we're going to torture people for their secrets. and. Uh, and, and But the thing about torture is that I think it goes to a soul level that's carried from lifetime to lifetime. So, so the, the wounding is not just um, uh, genetically or from a heritage or a lineage, it's from a soul level. And so if we can get rid of uh, inflicting the wounding, I think the, the incarnations of of new generations won't have that old, uh, mm, you know, soul um, um, patterns to overcome. I mean, I don't know how much you want to go into that because uh, that's a little I think it's, it's, yeah. No, I think it's, it's really part of the whole science of the field. But the field, mm -hmm. the memory even of, of, particles of particles is infinite and eternal. These things do not get lost, and we have this profound potential opportunity to start clearing out that repetitively destructive part of the past. So, but don't you think that there are signs in the rising generation of more tolerance and more openness, at least, that there is... Uh, yes, the governor, Scott Walker, arch conservative, I mean, very conservative guy, who's running for, for president, you know, railed against the Supreme Court decision on equal marriage for gay people. And his two sons, who wanted to help him with his campaign, really told their father they totally disagreed. And he, you know, so they considered themselves young and conservative, but they're actually, you know, for gay marriage. And I thought, this is a sign that, the, that in this generation, whether they call themselves conservative or, or progressive, there's a new level of tolerance rising. I think there's a lot happening below the radar screen. <laughs> yeah, I, I, I totally agree that uh, there is a change. Yeah, there's changes on generational levels, there's changes on consciousness levels. People are waking up. I mean, I know these uh, two young women, overnight they've had 
kundalini awakenings, mystical experiences. And before that, they were just going out to bars and, and they had no idea about energy or any of this other, other level. And I keep hearing stories about that. I think we are coming into a new time. I think the, it hasn't been won yet, the fight. Uh, you know, if you want to call fighting for peace, not, not a contradiction, but, the, uh, but there is a shift Yes, in the vibratory field, in, in the level of uh, awareness, the ability to love. Uh, um, I, I think it's all out in the open. And, and um, I think all the hard work people like you have done and so many others in the, in, in that, that have bridged both these movements, the, the spiritual consciousness realm and the activism realm, I think that hard work it will be seen, will be uh, PRR being shown for its benefit now. So what do you see about moving forward? Where's your work taking you now as a mystical activist? Well, it's certainly taking me into deeper reflection of what I've learned so that I can share the learning. And 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 examining things like power what is power and you know the activist community feel that they have to address power and 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 raise their own power in order to speak to power and yet learn that it's not about power over it's about power with and the spiritual community goes, oh, you know, we shun that, you know, we're going for inner power. But power, I think, is a very revealing conversation. And, and, and then power and humility, you know, the spiritual people will talk about humility. But what is humility, really? Isn't it really, in essence, if you unravel spiritual humility and you take out, you know, yes, my Lord, and any sense of I'm being humble before you, your majesty, you know, you take out that concept, what is humility? It's that sense of standing in the power of one's own essence, that I am called to be, that I have been called into existence, and I must stand in the power of my own essence and have the humility to reveal myself to the world. Because false humility is fake, it's a seduction, it's a horror show. There's so much false humility. Stand in the power of your own presence, your own gift, and you will see that action will follow. That, that the, the, the dynamic forces in action that are caused by consciousness are certainly activated when a being says, I am called to be. I mean, look at Wilbur and the abolition of slavery. All of his life, it wasn't just a one-minute letter campaign. It wasn't an overnight e email. It was strategy after strategy after this doesn't work, let's try that, this doesn't work, let's try this. That sense of being called by a vision to be a powerful force in the abolition of slavery and the commitment that went with it and the learning that went with it. So those are things I'm reflecting on these days. No, I, I think that's great. And do you, have you gotten to the point where and in all these cases you've mentioned where um, the effort you've put out there to, to make change in the world, you know, in the Middle East, in Africa, in, in all these troubled places you visited, is that, um, do you feel, yes, you're doing it for others, but it's also your soul growth because you've put that out there. I mean, how do you... How are you with that, you know, in the sense that, let's say the whole world is inside of you, what, what has been this um, uh, inner sense of your outward efforts, you know what I'm saying, as if the, the, the world is you, 
and it's everyone, but I'm interested because you've really put yourself out there in a, in a huge way to make change. I mean, heroic in, in many senses. And so how have you taken that and, and reflected on the inner change that those outer, outer efforts have brought you? Well, I'd, li I'd like to share with you that what I call the fractal of my life, which was that I was conceived days before my sister died. She fell down the steps at school and broke her spine and died. And my mother discovered that she was carrying me in the midst of mourning the loss of her daughter. So I'm a fractal of that coming into the womb of suffering and mourning and pain, I literally grow in her wounding and pain. But I am the sign of life for her. I am the inevitable story that says, you've got to deal with this one because life is happening. You've got to move the story forward. And in her beauty and in her strength, when I was born, she said to the family, that's really the end of the mourning period for Patricia. We must now celebrate this life. I feel that's my soul, Frank, to, to go into the heart of wounding and suffering and pain in a very real way, not in an intellectual way, but for to experience that's not the end of the story. You know, so you can imagine Amnesty International, the freeing of the prisoners, South Africa, the turning around with truth, reconciliation, forgiveness, restorative justice, all those new stories that say there is a new way, there is a way we can move the story beyond. And so I feel sometimes my darkest times have been where I, I feel the pull of the descent into chaos and cruelty is is overtaking us and are imperiling the planet. It's a very dicey moment. It's a very epic moment in our story. We have created colossal damage, colossal cruelty. But I, in order to be my soul, have to say with as much authenticity as possible, having witnessed horror upon horror, that is not the end of the story, folks, that we are still cooking, creating, bursting forth some other reality that is more integrated, more harmonious, more compassionate, and more just. So yes, thank you. No, that's beautiful. I really appreciate that. And I totally agree. We are birthing a new new realities. That's why I actually call my show New Realities because I know there's hope for uh, all the efforts uh, on the upliftment of humanity and uh, there's something else happening I think now in this time that hasn't happened in the last 2,000 or 5,000 years because we're all connected. We're all wired together just like this conversation where we're speaking you know, together and yet we're thousands of miles apart and um, that does something I think to change the psyche of humanity and see how we're wired together. Just the the field of humanity is wired together so for for people who are conscious of that we we know that and the people that are not conscious of that they they intuit it, they sense it and I think that's part of this acceleration of change and um, you know, of course, we we need people to come forward like yourself to take a stand and, and, and stand up for truth and freedom, justice, you know, all, all the um, fair things on this planet. And um, I think it's making a difference. And I, I, I know it is. And uh, I see a, a really bright future for the awakening of humanity. So... Oh, you so I asked you about like what's your future look like? You're saying you're going into uh, this introspection about your your work. So what else? Where are, where's your work taking you? Um, what how do you want to you know live and, and affect change in in the way you are now and and you know where you're at? 
Because you're not going to well, stop. I, I, <clears throat> I have moved to a place called Creststone, Colorado. And, you know, I think there was a very conscious move to say, I've got to live in a place where I can live my values, where I can live ecologically, where I can live, you know, spiritually and in community. Creston, Colorado, where thousands of acres have been given and donated to the world's spiritual conditions. So there's a lot of spiritual activity. There's an attempt at deeper community. There are ecological values. A lot of people here try to live off the grid and live, incarnate that new way of being. And believe you me, as with any such experiments, it brings up, you know, the ego and it brings up all the things that we are still learning about. But, so it seems to me that at this time in my life to be in a place that is trying to be the new value is really important. And maybe that's it. No, thank you. I appreciate that. And uh, I appreciate your work and your book, The Conscious Activists. And, uh, you know, I originally met you at the Institute of Noetic Science. Maybe we'll talk about that at some point. Uh, thanks for your time today, James. I want to thank you, Alan, for the dialogic encounter, for the depth of your questions, for the way you really hold, I think, these central issues and central questions and it is media like the your work that I really think is part of the voice of transformation at this time. Thank you for that. Thank you. This is Alan Steinfeld for New Realities. Thanks for listening and watching today. Good night.